Hear the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. To you, O Christ. <clears throat> the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Please do you help cry. Why was Jesus being tempted? Right now, after his baptism, he'd been through a mountaintop experience and right before the launch of his ministry, there was one primary reason, that Jesus Christ was about to launch into his ministry, an unbelievable ministry that was to determine the eternal fate of every person who has ever lived or ever would live the weight of its importance, the necessity of personal preparation, and the need for having the right plan pressed in upon him, he had to be prepared. Prepared mentally, prepared spiritually, prepared physically. And how could he prepare himself? There was only one way. He had to get alone with God and subject himself to gain complete control over his body and spirit. He had to get completely apart from the world. And this Jesus did. He was led by the spirit to separate himself from food and from everything else. He got alone from 40, for 40 days and 40 nights in order to be with God. And he launched into his ministry. He prayed, he thought, he meditated on the scriptures, no doubt, and he planned, he bore in such a heavy responsibility. And all the strain and all its weight, duty pressed in so heavily upon him. Just imagine the pressure and weight pressing upon his mind and his heart and his life. He begged for strength, no doubt, to his father to stand up against all that he was to face in the coming years. The preparation went on for 40 days, as you know, for 40 days and for 40 nights. In a book, 
a walk with God, R.C. Sproul said that Jesus was led into a lonely place, a wilderness. It was hardly a situation that is conducive to being strong in the spirit and inclined towards obedience to God. So it's important that we understand that the sight of Adam's temptation was more pleasant than that of Jesus's. But in addition to that, we also note that when Adam first encountered the temptation, he faced it with the companionship of his wife. And when Jesus was tempted, it was in the context of solitude. Just think of your own temptation, your own temptation experiences. Does any particular stand out in your mind? Is it not easy to compromise your ethics when you're alone or when you're unknown? When Jesus was confronted by Satan, he was far away from recognition. There was no one present to see what he would do. Not only was Jesus, was he there in a situation of loneliness, but Soren Kierengaard, the Danish philosopher, said once that loneliness is perhaps the most difficult of all human situations to, do, to endure for any length of time. Excuse me for a moment. Sit down. It is understood that the supreme form of punishment greater than even incarceration is solitary confinement. To be forced utterly alone, totally cut off from any form of human communication and fellowship. When Jesus Christ was faced with all the forces of hell in an attempt to undermine his integrity, he was there alone. He was there alone. Martin Luther said that uh, these remarks, they stand true, that prayer and meditation and temptation are the three best instructors of the gospel minister. Adam met Satan in a beautiful garden. But Jesus met him in a terrible wilderness. Adam had everything he needed, but Jesus was hungry after 40 days of fasting. Adam lost the battle and plunged humanity into sin and death. But Jesus won the battle and went on to defeat Satan in more battles, culminating in the final victory on the cross in John 12, 31. Now is the time for the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world to be driven out. And Colossians 2, 1 and 5 tells us, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them and by the cross. Our Lord's experience of temptation prepared him for our sympathetic high priest. In 2 Hebrews 2, 16 and 18. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. That he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Now there was more at stake in this event than at first appears. 
Adam and Eve were tempted by the devil and due to their failure plunged the human race into death and destruction. Since Jesus came to lead us out of death and destruction, he had to succeed where Adam and Eve failed. Therefore, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Satan did his best to disqualify Jesus from becoming the saviour of the world. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now Jesus had not eaten anything for 40 days, which is about as long as a person can go without any permanent injury to his body. Satan is a master of timing and waited until Jesus was at his weakest point before he began his assault. And there, the soil is rocky and some of the stones resemble, resemble loaves of bread. And since Jesus would multiply bread to feed thousands, Matthew 14, 19 to 20, he could have turned a stone into bread if he wanted to. But the fast was God's idea, it tells us in Luke 4, 1. So to break it prematurely would have been a sin. That would have disqualified Jesus from saving us from our sins. Matthew 1, 21 tells us, you are to call him Jesus, the angel said to Mary. For he will save his people from their sins. And Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone. This is the first of three quotations from the Old Testament, which Jesus used to battle Satan. Jesus' first line of defense was to quote God's word. The Bible is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 17, with which we can fight the devil. Christians who know the Bible well are in a better position to overcome temptation than those who do not know it. Jesus knew the Bible well enough to quote it, and he is our example. And the devil left, led him to a high place and showed him an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it's been given me and I can give it to anyone I want to if you worship me and it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Hall in his commentary said, this is one of the most fascinating conversations in the Bible in exchange for a moment of worship. Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. It had been given to me, he said, and I can give it to anyone I want, he said. The only thing more shocking was than that was Satan's claim is that Jesus did not deny it. In fact, the Satan's claim is actually supported by additional scripture. Three times Jesus called Satan the prince of this world. John 12, 31, John 14, 30, and John 16, 11. The apostle Paul called him the God of this age in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air, Ephesians 2, 2. And the apostle John was very clear when he wrote... The whole world is under the control of the evil one. 1 John 5, 1, 9. This is truly shocking, but he does explain a few things. Who goes on in his commentaries? If Satan controlled the world, we would expect the world to be completely confused about God. That was first of all. After thousands of years, the world has come to no consensus on the first two most important questions. Is there a God and what is he like? Second, if Satan controlled the world, we would expect the world to be filled with sin, sorrow and death. And every person born in this world goes through sin, sorrow, and death. And thirdly, if Satan controlled the world, we would expect to hear stories of rape, murder, and war. And all we would have to do is to turn on the news to hear stories of rape, murder, and war. 
Fourthly, if Satan controlled the world and God came into the world, we would expect the world to crucify God. So God came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ and it was only a matter of time before he was crucified. It seems like the whole world is under the control of the evil one. But how did this happen? Well, excuse me for a moment. The explanation is found in the first few chapters of the Bible. God created the world and put Adam and Eve in charge. As long as they were under God's authority, every day was paradise and Satan could not harm them. But when they ate the forbidden fruit, they stepped out from under God's authority and found themselves under, under Satan's authority. That was the end of paradise and the beginning of Satan's rule, Genesis 1 to 3. And ever since that day, our greatest need has been for someone to save us from the tyranny of Satan. The devil then led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, you will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully when they lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. This temptation was unique because Satan used the Bible to make his argument. He quoted from the 91st Psalm and argued that if Jesus, Jesus threw himself off the temple, God would send angels to catch him. Satan was saying that if Jesus believed the Bible, he should prove it by taking a leap. But Jesus refused to leap the, to leap. the purpose of the 91st Psalm is not to encourage rash behaviour, but simple trust in God. So Jesus rebuffed the devil by quoting another verse. Do not put the Lord your God to the test in Deuteronomy 6.16. This is how we should treat all the promises of God. Jesus said, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Matthew 21, 22. We ought to pray in faith, therefore, and believe that God will answer. But we should never use God's promises to force his hands, since God will not be forced to do anything. This may seem obvious, but in the name of faith, some parents have withheld medicine from their children with tragic results. The Bible is God's word, but Satan quotes it for his own purposes, such as leading us into, into, into rash behavior. The broad counsel of scripture is to pray in faith without putting God to the test. As Jesus prayed elsewhere, not my will, but yours be done, he said in Luke 22. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time, it says in Luke. We're not told when the opportune time was. But one of the last temptations Jesus faced was to come down from the cross Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. Matthew 27, 40 said his enemies. The devil may have been speaking through them and Jesus may have been tempted to take revenge. Deuteronomy 32, 41. But like other temptations, Jesus did not give in. Adam and Eve enjoyed a perfect environment and were only forbidden the fruit of one tree so that they could show their loyalty to God, Genesis 2, 17. They failed, however, and plunged the world into misery. Jesus faced hardships in life and death, but never failed once. He recovered everything Adam lost and reopened paradise for all who will believe. As Paul said, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. 
the word of God was used. Ore Torre, the scholar of yesteryear, he used the Bible to great effect. A man by the name of Mr. Dr. Congdon complained that he would get nothing out of his, could get nothing from his Bible study. The scripture, he said, seemed to be as dry as dust. Please tell me how to study it, he said. Read it, said Torrey. I do read it, said Congdon. Then read it some more, said Torrey. The doctor replied, how? Well, Torrey went on and explained what to do. Take some book and read it 12 times a day for a month. He said, what book can I read that many times a day, working as many hours as I do, said the doctor. And Dr. Torrey, a theologian, said, try the short sec book of Second Peter. Dr. Congdon followed his counsel and said, my wife and I read Second Peter three or four times in the morning, two or three times at noon, and two or three times at dinner. Soon I was talking Second Peter to everyone I met. It seemed as though the stars in the heavens were singing the story of Second Peter. I had read uh, second piece on my knees, marking passages, teardrops mingled with the crayon colours, and said to my wife, See how oh, I've ruined this part of my Bible, he says. Yes, she said. But as the pages have been getting black, your life has been getting white. The Bible will do this for you, Christian will help you, non-Christian too, if you'll only read it and reread it and believe the word of God, it would help you to resist temptation. God's word is so powerful. It's the sword of the spirit. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike, for those words. <clears throat> and as we've heard those words, let us now affirm our faith by saying together, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. This kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So this morning in our intercessions, when I say Lenten Lord, if you can respond by saying, hear our prayer. Lenten Lord. And the format for the um, prayers this morning, I'm going to read a Bible verse and then... Um, um, a response to that in prayer. Rend your hearts, not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, 
for he is gracious and merciful. Lord, we return to you again in Lent and ask you to spring clean our lives. Sweep through the closed rooms of our hearts where the dust of resentment and the cobwebs of self-pity have gathered. Clear out the excess that keeps us from simplicity and the rubbish that accumulates in the attic of our mind. Give us a pure focus on you, on your grace, mercy and peace. Lenten Lord. It is not this the fast that I choose, to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free. Lord, release us from our obsession with ourselves and our own desires, and raise our sights to the world of injustice that needs a constant critique from people of faith and goodwill. Help us to look the world in the eye, to expose corruption and hold our leaders to account, so that the poor are not sacrificed on the altar of greed. Lenten Lord, hear our prayer. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Teach us, good Lord, to listen to your voice, redolent with the truth among the siren voices of our time. We pray for our politicians, advertisers, journalists and opinion formers, that they may resist the temptations of the post-fact, post-truth world and seek only the wisdom that withstands compromise and cowardice. For your word stands tall in the field of half truce. We pray for things that we read in the news today. Lenten Lord, hear our prayer. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The world sees all sorts of problems with self-denial, voluntary sacrifice, and following anything other than our own instincts. Enable us to live the truth of your invitation that we can commend with integrity the faith that empowers us and the Lord who captivates us. May our lives tell the story we long to share. Lenten Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new right spirit within me. Good Lord, purify, purify our priorities this Lent as we pursue that clean heart and right spirit. As we live under the dazzling gaze of your love, help us to return that gaze with joy so to be drawn into the generous flow of your grace forever pouring out into the world. This Lent, may our hearts be refixed on you, O God, and on the following way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the Collect. Almighty God, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, May we enter into the mystery of Christ's sufferings and by following in his way, come to share in his glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 